Yo, yo, yo. Hey guys, welcome back to another awesome edition of the Best Practices Show podcast. My name is Kirk Barrett and I have the awesome pleasure of finding the greatest people in dentistry and asking them for insight on how to create a better practice and a better life. And I get to share it with you. I feel so blessed. And today I bring back one of my heroes. This guy is awesome. Dr. Jim McKee. And he's going to share with us what all that clicking and popping is that's going on with your patients in your practice. And we have a candid conversation about how that works with your patients and your business. So you got to check this out. I know you'll enjoy it. And we'll see you soon. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show podcast. I'm so pumped, so grateful that you're here because you know what you get to do? You get to come on this journey with me. I'm a CE junkie. I get to learn from some of the best in all of dentistry. It's so cool. You don't have to be the smartest person in the world. You just got to hang around with some of the smartest people in the world. And today we're going to do that with Dr. Jim McKee. And we're going to be talking about an important subject. It's the clicks and pops in practice. What do they mean? Jim, thanks for being on, brother. I appreciate it. Kirk, it's great to be with you as always, and I hope you're doing really well. We got a fun topic today to talk about. We do, and I'm so grateful to get any time with you. You're behind the scenes for the Restorative Academy, you know, making all these things happen. I want you to talk about what that means. And then uh, I also want to point this out because I point it out every time you're on is Jim's an important person in my journey. You know, when I had hair and I was early in this journey, what you'll find in dentistry is it's a very noble profession. What's really cool about this is you meet people that are on the path way ahead of you and they go, jump in my car. I'll introduce you to so-and-so. And Jim's done that for me, you know? And so Jim, I'm just grateful for who you are and what you do. You're doing a lot of things. You teach at Spear. You're heavily involved in the Restorative Academy. You have your own study club, which I want you to talk about. But if no one has heard you or your name, who's Jim McKee? Let's start there. Well, thank you for the very kind words, as always. Uh, Jim McKee is a neighborhood dentist who got out of school after four or five years and didn't really understand occlusion. I saw a lot of cases that intimidated me. I started to pull away from starting to recommend treatment planning on more complex cases because I really didn't understand how the teeth should fit together. But what I really didn't understand is when someone came in with a cl clicking joint or a popping joint, what that meant to me. So I did what most of us are taught to do is I ignored it. And really the longer I ignored it, what I started to notice is that sometimes people with the clicking and popping sometimes had pain, but sometimes they didn't have pain. So it kind of started my journey in this whole area of occlusion really started out as most people do from a pain-based perspective, because if a clicking joint didn't hurt, I basically ignored it. And sometimes that's the right thing to do. But what I've learned over the years, it's every clicking joint is not the same. So really my confidence grew as I was able to understand the significance of patients who came in. Really a clicking joint is basically a structurally altered joint. And part of the problem is, as dentists, we're taught about occlusion in terms of how the teeth fit together. And while that's an important part of it, the reality it is really occlusion today should really be defined, I think, is how the lower jaw fits to the upper jaw. So it's not only how the teeth fit together, but it's also how the right joint fits against the right joint socket with the disc in between and the left joint fitting in the left joint socket with the disc in between. So where I used to think of occlusion as primarily how the teeth fit, now I'm thinking of it basically as a tripod and how do the three legs fit together? What I've learned over the years is that many times we have problems at the back end of the system 
because we have some type of structural alteration of the joint. And I didn't understand that in the early years. I was focused just on the teeth. Yeah, I want you to talk about two things because occlusion is always one of those interesting conversations in dentistry. You know, you hear this one. Oh, I learned all that in dental school. And what you find out is you haven't even started learning about that yet. Uh, you learn as it gets to go. And the other thing I really love about what you did, Jim, is you picked a path. You picked a path in dentistry. And what some dentists don't think as well, they think, well, occlusion, no one's going to come to my practice. I'm not going to be busy enough doing that. Can you speak to both of those? And then let's get into the clicking and popping. We, you, you know, it's really funny when we talk about occlusion, you know, we were talking a little bit at a SPEAR workshop recently about why patients come to our practices. And generally, it usually is one of two reasons, either because we're in network or we're out of network. I mean, really, if you think about it, that's what brings people into our practices. In network is probably going to be an insurance-based patient that's coming for a reason that's probably dictated by third-party coverage. And that's totally understandable. Some patients will specifically come to an out-of-network practice because there's a skill set that that out-of-network practice has that they're seeking. So generally, patients come either for specific in-network or specific out-of-network practices or services that they can receive from the office. And I have to tell you, I didn't understand that again in the early years. I was just trying to be the best restorative dentist I could become because I was hanging out with people like Pete Dawson, like Erwin Becker at the Panky Institute, Frank Spear, John Coyce. I mean, I was so lucky. I had so many dentists look after me and really helped me up the ladder to try and learn more. And I would try and take a little bit of knowledge from each of them as I went along the way. But really, what led me to making changes in the practice was really trying to figure out how the occlusion works. Because when dentists really understand occlusion, what happens is we see how many patients occlusion touches in our practice. So if a patient's going to come to you, maybe let's say for an out-of-network service, it could be implants, it could be airway, it could be holistic dentistry, it could be aesthetics, it could be any of those. But I will tell you that most of the time, occlusion or joint diagnosis is the easiest way to build a practice because quite frankly, no one wants to do it. Yeah. And ultimately what has happened in my practice is I would have patients referred for a bite evaluation or a joint evaluation. And ultimately the dentist who would send the patient over and say, well, why don't you go ahead and do the restorative work? Because the intimidation factor of working with someone with a structurally altered joint was really too great and they would just as soon not have to deal with that. So for years, honestly, that's how my restorative practice grew, doing restorative cases on dentists who didn't wanna do them because there was a joint component that the patient presented with. So I would really encourage dentists, especially young dentists, if you're looking to build a practice where patients are gonna to come to you for a specific reason and not necessarily because of the insurance company that you're affiliated with, if you can learn how to diagnose joints and understand occlusion, I think it's the fat. I know it's the fastest way to do it, quite frankly, because no one else wants to do it. Yeah, that's, that's the reality. Jim, that is so well said. I love it. And this hasn't aired yet, but you'll hear this. I actually interviewed Jeff Rouse on his top pet peeves in dentistry. And he said some, you'll love it because uh, when you go back and listen to it, he'll say, I hate it when I'm out at Spear. And everyone goes, oh, these patients are in your practice. Well, they were, they were in, they're just in your practice. No, they came to my practice, but they were in your practice for 25 years, you know, type of a thing. Well, we all see the same practice. We all yeah. see the same patient base in our practice. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Jeff and I are going to be doing a program for the faculty club at Spear this year. We're going to do it together titled, Are We Treating the Same Patient? Jeff's going to talk about from an airway component. I'm going to talk about from a joint component. But really today, with especially the popularity that airway has, you have to know joints if you're going to do airway today. Yeah. I mean, really, so many of the problems that we see with airway are at the maxillary level, and there's some constriction of the nasal complex, so we don't have adequate breathing. 
but we have a lot of collapsed pharyngeal airway space as well. And a lot of times that's related to the joint. So really in order to treat airway today, I think today you really have to be a, a, an expert in occlusion as well, because so many times those patients have both of those problems going on. So I really think that today occlusion is the foundation for so many things that we do on a day-to-day -day practice. Regardless of the complexity of the case, the occlusion touches everything. Yeah. So let's go there. Let's go there. Take us in to what we need to know if I'm listening. You know, well, you know we, here's, here's the thing to think about, really. You know, when I look back at my career, if I was a 30-year-old dentist and I had a 30-year-old new patient come in, a lot of those patients had large amalgams or were going to need crowns over the course of the next 25 years. So a lot of my early production revenue was generated through doing crown work on old fillings. If I'm a 30-year-old new dentist today and a 30-year-old new patient comes in, they don't have that type of restorative work, future restorative work that's going to be necessary to replace those composites or whatever would be filling the tooth today. So I think today what you're going to see is though a lot of those patients have had orthodontics that maybe now has relapsed and hasn't been stable because there's been an occlusal component that wasn't recognized. So today, I think as a practicing dentist, it becomes more important forever to understand occlusion, but especially to understand the joints. So let's make it real easy. Basically, when we talk about occlusion and joints, it's a ball and socket joint. Top of the lower jaw fits into the base of the skull and muscles contract to open and close the jaw. So if it's a ball and socket joint, we don't want the ball or the condyle to grind against the base of the skull or the joint socket. So we've got a disc in there that attaches like a bucket handle. And the disc has attachments on the outside lateral pole, inside medial pole. And if those attachments tear, that's how we start to click or pop. You know, I mean, we've, I really think we've made joints way too complicated. Part of it is, is because we never saw them. You know, everything that we saw in our knowledge about jaw joints was basically an artist's drawing based upon what a dentist told them they thought it looked like. When we started to image, back when imaging came out 30 years ago, we realized, hmm, and that's not really an accurate representation of what we're seeing anatomically. Many times the structural breakdown was far greater than the drawings in the textbooks. And that's why occlusion became an unpredictable discipline in dentistry. Today, if we can understand the structural changes at the joint level, the discussion becomes so much easier. So basically structural alterations generally start at the soft tissue level. If you've got hard tissue bone and soft tissue disc, we generally don't see bone issues if the disc is protecting the bone. So the tipping point or the first domino that has to fall is really a ligament tear. And that can be a ligament tear at the outside, the lateral pole, which would be a partially displaced disc. If we were looking at the literature, it'd be called a displaced disc with reduction, which means we get back under the disc when we open. But I'm gonna add a qualifier I'm going to say at the lateral pole. The other type of disc displacement we have is if the ligament tears at the medial pole. Easy enough to think about. Partial disc displacement at the lateral, complete disc displacement at the lateral and the medial pole. So that's the first part to think about. Is it a partial disc displacement or a complete disc displacement? Now, the reason why that's important is because if we look at the joint socket, we talked about bite forces, and when we bite down, we have a lot of muscle force that we can generate when we bite down. The muscles are positioned between the teeth and the joints. Force is gonna be distributed between the teeth and the joints. At the tooth level, what we try and do is to make sure that every tooth touches with the same amount of force. We don't wanna overload one, two teeth. They break, they wear, they loosen. So basically, we're trying to get an even bite to distribute all the bite forces through the roots of the teeth and into the bone. At the joint level, basically, it's different anatomy. So there we have a soft tissue disc. 
And as long as the disk is in the right place, we can distribute the load really well. But you know what else the disk does, which is really, I think, from a restorative perspective, the most important role? I think of it as a three-dimensional gasket. And when I say that to patients, they're not quite sure what a gasket is. And I say, think about when you open your refrigerator door, the plastic molding that keeps the cold air in, that's a gasket. So basically, it's a softer material between two harder surfaces. That's what the disc is. But really, it's a three-dimensional soft tissue positioning tool that positions our condyle. So when we close, we have a bite that fits together, basically the same every time we close down. If we don't have the soft tissue gasket there, if the disc is displaced, we have a little more play at the back end of the system which means we have a little bit more play at the front end of the system. Once I was able to put those pieces together, from hearing Mark Piper talk about joints, from hearing Pete Dawson talk about occlusion, the whole thing started to make a little bit more sense because I understood many times the reason why the front teeth didn't fit together was really because there were structural changes at the joint level. And basically, since it's all one piece, the whole thing moves back based upon what's happening at the foundation. Yeah. So that's kind of an abridged version, but that's the easiest way, I think, to think about occlusion. Yeah. And when it comes to occlusion, it's not one of those things you get right once with a patient. Patients are going to be living longer. And I, you know, I, I, one of the things I'll never forget, Pete used to say this all the time. You know, you can do all of this, but we're going to have to manage forces for the lifetime of this patient. So would you agree it's a little bit of a moving target every single time in some respect when you're taking a look at occlusion? I completely agree with that statement. And part of the reason is because generally what we're seeing is we're seeing injuries at the joint level earlier than we ever thought. You know, when you really think about the jaw joint, it's an orthopedic joint. The problem is orthopedic physicians don't look at this. There's not an orthopedic physician that I know that thinks of this jaw joint as an orthopedic joint. So now it falls to the dental world where normally it would fall to the oral surgery profession, their specialty. Oral surgeons are plenty busy out taking wisdom teeth out, doing an orthognathic surgery, placing implants. So from a patient's perspective, it's an area that's kind of fallen through the cracks, really, in terms of trying to get diagnosis and treatment, which goes back to what we talked about earlier. If you can be the dentist in your community who can recognize these problems and give people answers, they will beat a path to your door. And that's exactly what happens in clinical practice. It really is. Yeah. So when we talk about managing occlusion, I think to your point, people are living longer people are also getting injured earlier. You know, if I look back, when my mom was younger, she didn't drive till she was 30. She wasn't playing travel soccer, travel basketball, getting elbowed in the jaw. She wasn't having the amount of facial injuries slash trauma slash whatever you want to call it to growing patients, especially females who are in a subset of patients who are least able to adapt to an injury to the joint. Right. You know, females tend to have a more lax ligament system to account for childbirth. And what happens is, especially today in growing patients, we see more joint injuries than we used to. Yeah. So that's really, I think, the, the big change, I would say, in the last 20 years is that we're starting to recognize the younger patients. And generally, their presentation to the office is with a class two occlusion. Most of the time, because if the disc is off, we now see an increased likelihood that we're not going to get normal growth. And if that's the case, many times the occlusion now presents with the mandible being not out far enough. And all of a sudden we've got a class two case that becomes a more difficult case to treat now. Yeah. I'm going to give you a moment here though. You'll love this. So we've done hundreds and hundreds of master classes, like through COVID. Do you know what the number one requested re replay is? Like you, this will blow your mind and this will give you a proud moment. Do you, you take, Don't it's, know. it's Drew McDonald's. Uh, he did two of them air, uh, occlusal occlusion di directed or TMD directed, uh, orthodontics and airway. Like he's done two different times. 
I probably get a request. And Drew, if you're listening to this, it's amazing. Almost every day I get a request. Can I watch that again? Can I share that? Can I have a copy of that? You, you, you know, you have a study club with him. You've watched him and sure. he is just a thought leader. It's so amazing how many people are eating this information up. And I have to believe it's because they need it in their practices. You know, Drew, Drew has done such an awesome job bringing this to the orthodontic world. He really has stepped up. He started imaging joints and he's been really consistent about recognizing the class two patient and the relationship that exists with structurally altered joints. He's really talking about the average orthodontic practice. You know, there's a lot of discussion that we think that the class two growing patient is a genetically based problem. It's not reality because when we image the joints, we generally never see structurally intact joints. But, you know, you ask the average orthodontist, what percentage of your new patients are class two? You hear 50, 60, 70 percent. And Drew's showing routinely now the relationship between structurally altered joints, the class two patient and also the airway patient. Because, as I said a couple of minutes ago, Jeff, Drew, myself are all coming to the same conclusions that it's basically the same patient. Yeah. That's why today you have to know airway, you have to know joints in order, I think, to have a predictable restorative practice because those are the things that we're seeing on a regular basis today. Yeah, I have so many questions I want to ask you. I want to go back to the clicking and popping. And then I want to sure. cross the bridge to, you know, one. it's one thing to understand it as a clinician, but it's another thing to communicate this. So let's go back to the clicking and popping. What else do sure. I need to know in practice? And then help us understand how in the heck do we communicate this to patients? Easiest thing to think about clicking and popping. Number one, is it a partially herniated disc or a completely herniated disc? Because if it's clicking and popping, it's herniated. Now, I'll give you a tiny exception. It's an outlier just so we have a little bit of context here. You can also get a click or pop if you open really wide and maybe open past the crest of the eminence. You might get an opening click at 40, at 42, at 45 millimeters, but that's exceedingly rare. That's probably one to 2% of the cases. So most of the cases, if a patient comes in with a click or a pop, the question is, is it the ligament torn at the lateral pole or is it torn off the lateral pole and the medial pole? If it's the 60-year-old patient who's been clicking for 30 years and never had a problem, I'm thinking it's probably a partially herniated disc because discs that are completely herniated, generally, if they have problems, because they all don't, because some will adapt, but the problems generally are in that population. If, that, if they do have problems, they generally present in one of two ways. Something hurts, which is a low distribution issue because the soft tissue isn't present and now the bone's grinding against the joint socket or something hurts or something doesn't fit, which is namely the teeth because we've lost the gasket and now we have a bite that doesn't fit together because we don't have stability at the back end of the system. And as that changes, now the front teeth don't fit together either. So in terms of clicks or pops, number one, is it a partially herniated disc or a completely herniated disc? Number two, does it present as something's hurting or something's not fitting? Now, one of the things that you have to do as a dentist when you're checking whether it fits or not, we can have the patient close down and see how the teeth come together and look at it that way. What we also should do, though, is not only check from a dental position, but also check from a skeletal position. So if we can seat the joints in the socket, whether you use by manual like Pete Dawson talked about, whether you use a leaf gauge like Frank Spear talks about, whether you use an anterior program like John Coyce talks about, what we want to do is to position the condyle skeletally and then look at the bite. And here's the take home. 
If the byte's uncoupled greater than the thickness of the disk, let's call it two millimeters, then the likelihood increases that we've lost the gasket at the back end of the system. That's the easiest way to think about it, really. That's an old tool that Mark Piper called reading the byte. And basically what you're doing is you're looking at the anterior tooth relationship in a skeletal position. And really what you're doing is you're now comparing that space to the thickness of the disc. It's a real easy clinical skill to look at. I think, honestly, it's probably the easiest clinical screening tool that we have along with understanding the history. Yeah. You know, when I do my exam, you say, how do you communicate it to patients? Something hurts or something doesn't fit. That's the easiest way to explain it. I think sometimes we've made it too complicated for patients. And if something hurts or something doesn't fit, what we're going to do is probably what you're going to want to get, Mrs. Jones, is you're going to want to get four things so you can make a better treatment decision on what you want to decide you want to do. From your exam, it looks like that we've lost the gasket at the back end of the system. So you'll probably want to get an MRI so we can see the soft tissue. You want to get a CT scan so we can see the hard tissue to understand what's happening at the joint level. We'll scan your teeth and we'll print 3D models so we can study your bite at the front end of the system. And then we'll take clinical photographs to tie everything together. Yeah. So that conversation occurs by the end of the new patient examination. Because from a practice management perspective, I have a relatively low exam fee with a relatively long exam. That means in order to make the numbers work, I have to have a diagnostic records fee that's going to be higher because when I combine the time from the exam, the time for diagnostic records, and the time for the consultation appointment, that has to sync up with what I would be doing if I was doing restorative dentistry from a production perspective in order for me to be able to run my practice. Yeah, so can I ask so you So that's this? why the ability to recognize it Go ahead. Yeah. So I was just, I, I love this. I love this. So I, I want to, uh, you know, I'm thinking of the listener that's, that's listening to this. So I'm 32, Jim, and I'm, I totally get what you're saying. Now, what I say to the patient, I'm going to do all this. What, and so I'll, I'll be the patient for a second. Dr. McKee, why do we do all this? Yes. You know, I, cause you got to be equipped with that answer too. It's the, so that, so I'm going to do this and I'm going to recommend this so that, you know, what's the, so that for this. For the patient. So that is so you can make so you can make a good treatment decision based upon what the anatomy shows. Okay. That's so really what it comes down to. Now, the problem is though, what I learned, which I would really suggest younger dentists think about, I used to present treatment plans or discussions like this before the patient had enough information to make a good decision. Right. What I have changed is I have front-loaded my educational discussion with the patient earlier in the appointment than I ever did in the past. So generally this discussion starts by taking a history. If they say they clicked, if they said they had ortho because they had a large overbite, if they, they said they had ortho with headgear, I know right off the bat that likely there was a joint-based problem. So if they're coming in specifically for a joint-based issue, I'm going to educate them early so that really by the time we get to the end of the clinical exam, all that's doing is verifying what we talked about initially before we even looked in their mouth based upon what I learned from their history. Yeah. So it's really been very effective in my hands implementing in the practice, bringing the education discussion earlier in the appointment rather than leaving it at the end you're trying to wrap up the appointment. You've got another patient. That patient's getting ready to leave. I'm going to say early on, if you want to know what your treatment options are and what's going to be best for you, you're going to want to make it based upon what the anatomy looks like. And from what you've told me, it sure sounds like we've got some structural alterations at the joint level you're going to want to take a look at. Yeah. It's never me. It's never me. It's always about you so you can make a good decision. I love it. I absolutely love it. So, and I know these questions always come up, but Jim, like I get it, but I'm going to need time to do this with patients. Like I'm going to have to slow down my practice a little bit because you have to really 
I mean, you, you, you got to pay attention and you probably got to invest some time. And number two, just talk about in rough terms, kind of the business component. So it, it, it happens with everything. Airway, how would I even make money doing that? Occlusion, how would I even make money doing this? Like, how does it fit my business plan? Um, anything you would add to those? Uh, I have a lot to add to that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. And I, I want I want, I always want to help the young dentist who's like, I can't do that. I'm like, no, you can do this, you know? For me, I was always looking to try and build a patient base that valued the service I was offering. Right. So for me, I was really fortunate. I learned this at the Pankey Institute, that if I could build a patient base of patients who valued the type of dentistry I was offering, it was more likely that they would say yes to treatment or that we would do treatment, but we may have to phase it. My mistake early is that I was presenting treatment plan to patients who weren't ready to hear it. Mm. They, they didn't value it. So the first question that came out of their mouth is how much does insurance cover? Right. And a lot of the stuff I was doing wasn't covered by insurance. So I had a lot of no's. So it kind of goes back to what we were saying about front loading them with information so they have enough information to make a good decision. But in terms of implementing, my best advice to a young dentist is just take a half a morning or just take a morning a week and make that your comprehensive dentistry day, whatever you want to call it. And I'm talking about joints and occlusion, but really what I think the practice of the future is going to be is really going to be the diagnostic practice. You're not going to have, as I said before, as much restorative dentistry to do as we've had in the past simply because people are taking better care of their teeth and we have better materials. So I think what you are going to have is a diagnostic practice, though, that might be joint-based, that might be occlusion-based, that might be airway-based, that might be orthodontically-based. It could be anything like that. But what we have to do, I think, is become diagnosticians. Yeah. Because so many times the patients who I have seen who have problems have not had treatment plans that have been developed with a comprehensive thought process. And as a result, the patient got halfway through the treatment and maybe the treatment wasn't going well and the dentist realized it and they had a hard time getting out of it. So from peace of mind in terms of enjoying the profession, I would really recommend if we can start to develop treatment plans that have a comprehensive level and then we can take a little bit at a time. Now, that's tough as a young dentist because you feel pressured. You have to produce. You've got bills to pay. So there's a fine line there, and I, I totally understand that. And sometimes it's going to take a little bit of time to implement it into your practice. But really what I thought about is really what type of practice was I trying to put together? Yeah. Was I trying to put together an insurance-based practice or was I trying to put together a a patient base that would come to me for reasons other than insurance. No, I still see patients today that come for insurance reasons. So I'm not saying you have to get rid of that or you shouldn't do that. But I'm saying if you can develop another side of the practice, a diagnostic practice, I always think of it almost as a diagnostic subspecialty in my neighborhood practice. And the beauty of that from a practice management perspective is I have a column for my production then they have a column for the assistance production. And if we can create a diagnostic practice, whether it's airway, whether it's joints, whether it's restorative, whether it's implants, our assistant now can produce revenue through diagnostics. And all of a sudden now you start to build a practice that has some sustaining numbers and you have enough money now to go to some CE that will allow you to implement more. You know, I think we talked about this last time. When I look back at my practice, there's nothing that I have done that has had a greater return on investment than continuing education. Yeah. I mean, that that's what allowed me to, to, to treat patients that I never would have treated otherwise. Yeah. So if you can develop a practice that has a fee structure that allows you to save money for retirement, to be able to, as I said, take CE, to be able to pay a staff a good wage so you can retain good people and pay them well. To me, I honestly think that's the patient base that I'm looking to serve is with that practice. And I got to tell you, I think there's a lot of patients looking for that today. Yeah, We have a lot of patients um, who are specifically looking for a fee-for-service practice 
because they've had experiences that they want to get a different level of treatment. Yeah. We've really noticed that a lot, especially coming out of COVID. Yeah. We've had a significant number of new patients calling specifically seeking a level of expertise that they probably weren't able to get previously. Yeah. Now you're a pretty humble guy. So I'm going to ask you this. You're surrounded by some of the best dentists in the world. I love calling out the truth of an excellent dental practice, like the best dentist I've ever seen. It's a balance of services. You know, anyone says I'm doing full mouth stuff all day long. I'm, I don't know. I, I probably wouldn't invest a lot of time to listening to their stories, but really, uh, can you talk about the reality as a listener? Like what's a really great, and you talked about it already. It's like, you've got your columns of like your diagnostic stuff, and then you've got bread and butter things that you're doing. Would, can you speak to that? I, I honestly almost think of it like being a baseball player. You know, there's an old school, yeah, there's an old say, you know, if you're a baseball player, if you can hit for average and hit for power, that's kind of what I did for my practice. I had a regular practice. I would do single unit crowns. I would do direct restorations. And as my skill set started to increase first in recognizing problems and then being able to provide treatment, what I started to do was to do bigger cases. I still had the bread and butter stuff going, but I started to add to that. That was my pathway. I was never a huge full mouth person. You know, I heard something at the Pank Institute a long time ago. It said, you know, you never really, the easiest way to practice is if you never have to take an impression of more than one, more than six teeth at a time, because you could do lower anteriors, upper anteriors, lower posteriors, upper posteriors, now you can do the whole thing at once and I know that it can be done well and I've done it. But if I have my druthers, I'd rather do it in segments. You know, there's an old saying that every full mouth rehabilitation is just a lot of single unit crowns on one patient. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we can use provisionals well, generated from a diagnostic wax up that has the end in mind, so what we're trying to build to we can now bring that into the mouth, make the changes, use our provisionals as a proving ground to make sure that we're happy with the contours of the work. Then we can start to change the provisionals out to the final restorations at a very relaxed pace. You might be able to do it a little bit faster if you do it all at once. But again, I think from a patient's perspective, it's a little easier way to go through the process. And for me, it gave me a little bit more of a safety net as a young dentist trying to implement this, because if I had a problem with one section, I wasn't committed to the whole case. I could still maybe go back and make a modification if I had to. So I think in the real world, I think you pick and choose the cases, honestly, based upon when I look at it, the patients that are ready for them. Yeah. You know, again, I think that a lot of times if I look back at my mistakes, it's because I was provide I was recommending treatment to patients that simply weren't ready to hear it yet. Technically the, the treatment was correct, but I hadn't prepped them well enough so that they can make a good decision and accept the treatment. Yeah. Now, realistically, you're not gonna get everyone. So there's gonna be people that no matter how well you explain it, they're not gonna be able to do it for whatever reason it may be. But I think that number can really, your case acceptance rate can increase dramatically based upon how we explain things to patients and how we give them choices to, to move through a case, either all at once or on a phased basis based upon if they need to do that. Yeah, Jim, I have like nine more questions. We could turn this into a two hour show. And I know I'm just so grateful because I'm you're a busy guy and I know you got stuff going on. But oh, uh, I, I do this all the time. This is a blast. Oh my gosh. I have so many other thoughts I want to ask you and uh, we'll, we'll probably save them for another show. I want you to talk about your study club, Spear and the Restorative Academy. Uh, and we'll do that in just a second. But I also, any last thoughts? you know, as we wrap up this conversation on clicks and popping in your practice? I guess, I guess my, if, if we're going to wrap this, what I would be thinking about is that I'm hoping that the people listening to this podcast will redefine occlusion. And if we can redefine occlusion to include not only the teeth, but also the back end of the system and the joints as well, all of a sudden now occlusion, honestly, 
becomes very predictable. And with occlusion, so does joints. And what it does, it opens up a huge, huge arena of patients that are seeking this type of treatment and they'll find your way to your practice. So my, my take home is don't be intimidated by this, embrace it because you can build a practice really quickly, quite frankly, the better you get at doing this. So yeah. that would be my message. Love it. Um, let me talk about Spear a little bit. Spear, um, we teach you, I teach you advanced occlusion workshop out there with Gary DeWood. This is the exact type of information that we go over for three days. We do a lot of treatment planning. We do a lot of hands-on. Um, it's a it's a great course. It's gotten great reviews. Um, if you're looking for more information like this, it's an easy way to get it. Um, and again, I, I include a lot of information on implementation, a lot on forms, a lot on verbal skills. We kind of walk through it. And the last afternoon, we t focus entirely on implementation because I want it to be more than a three-day workshop you go to that's interesting. I want you to be able to go home and start to put it into practice right away, which you'll be able to do. It'll take you a while to work in some of the nuances, but my whole goal in teaching that is to decrease the steepness of the learning curve because today we can decrease the steepness of the learning curve. It's kind of why we started the Chicago Study Club, which is an offshoot of what we do. I do that with Kurt Ringhofer, Seth, Andrew McDonald. So the four of us teach that together and that's a blast. So that's a uh, couple days in the fall, a couple days in the spring in Chicago. And then usually in February, I'm either at the American Equilibration Society. Um, if your listeners haven't gone to that, that's a great meeting to think about going to. It's a Wednesday, Thursday in Chicago. It's usually the third week in February. It's at the Marriott in downtown Chicago. And then Saturday, Sunday is America can have a restorative dentistry at the Four Seasons here in Chicago. And it's a, it's a fun week of dental education. I really think you see some top-notch speakers and those meetings, they're kind of different than a workshop or something like that. I always, I always, when I was choosing my CE, I like to go both to the smaller workshop, hands-on study club stuff, because that's where I really learned how to implement. That's why I started a local study club 32 years ago, and we still meet um, September through May every year. And that's about implementation. The larger meetings like American Equilibration Society, American Academy of Restorative Dentistry, for those, those expanded my vision. So it gave me an idea of what was out there and gave me something to go learn based upon what I had seen from those types of meetings. So for me, both types of education really played a different role in my development and they were extremely valuable hearing both of those different types of learning for me that resonated really well. Yeah, I'm going to encourage you guys, if you want to expand your vision, you got to hang out with Jim. He's always going to keep you on your learning edge. And I'm actually mad because you guys are having one of the best of all time come to your study club in March, on March 31st. And the reason I know that, it's my birthday. And I'm going to be out of the country with my family. And so you're having Dr. Bill Robbins come to your study club. I'm so mad that, uh, and I, you know, if you're not taking notes during this podcast, don't worry, we're taking notes for you. So flip up to the notes, you're going to see a link to Jim's study club, all of Jim's information, everything that Jim has mentioned, you can just click right on the link. It'll take you right there. I'm going to highly encourage you to check that stuff out. You'll be in room with people that care about you and they will help you. They'll have your back in expanding your vision and putting into play. So I'm so mad. Can you ask Bill? Hey, you got to ask Bill to come back. Like that's, that's not fair. You know, so I'll, I'll, put, I'll put the squeeze on Bill to come back. There you go, Jim. I am so grateful, buddy. So thank you for being on today. Um, you're just the best. I really appreciate this. I can't thank you enough, Kirk, for everything you do in dentistry and for the opportunity to be here with you. It's always a treat. Thank awesome, you. Awesome. Stick around, Jim. I always think about everybody else, but thank you guys for listening to the best practices show podcast. Hey, go visit Jim. I'm just going to say it, whether it be at Spear, you know, in Chicago at those meetings or his study club, I promise you, it'll be a great investment of time. You'll be surrounded by some really cool people that'll expand your vision and 
you'll leave fired up, which is what we all need. So make sure you do that. Um, keep sending us suggestions for things that you guys will see. You're going to see, I'm going to have Jim back over and over and over again. He doesn't even have a choice. I'm just making him come back and uh, I'll keep introducing topics. I get them all the time from you guys. I really appreciate it. And keep sharing these episodes. If you enjoy today, do me a favor, just hit the share button. And until we see you guys next time, or you hear from us next time, keep watching or keep listening to the best practices show. You guys enjoy your day. Thank you.